Okay, hello and welcome everyone to our panel discussion this afternoon on how food companies are investing in lifelong health and wellness for consumers. Uh, my name is Matthew Pullen, I'm SVP here at LSX and one of the directors of the Healthspan show. Uh, I'm here to guide you through what I'm sure is going to be a really fascinating discussion. I'm joined by a, a stellar lineup of panelists for today's sessions, uh, representing some of the biggest food companies in the world. Uh, the aim of today's panel is really to provide some insight into how these food companies are thinking about health and wellness, how high up is it on their priority list, where do they see the biggest opportunities and challenges, and what are their current corporate investment partnership and R&D strategies. I'd really encourage you to post questions for our panelists at any time during the session. Uh, I'll keep an eye on the chat and pick up on them at some point over the next 45 to, to 50 minutes. I'm going to start by introducing our panelists uh, and I'll ask them all to give a brief overview of their, their current roles and responsibilities. Uh, we'll start with uh, Miriam. Miriam Uberal is Vice President uh, of R&D International at the Kraft, Kraft Heinz Company. Uh, Miriam, would you like to introduce yourself and explain your, your background and role at, at Kraft Heinz? Very good. Thank you, Matt. And good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm calling in from the Netherlands here in Nijmegen. We have our International Center of Excellence within Kraft Heinz. Um, I'm heading R&D for the International Zone in Kraft Heinz, which is basically all markets outside of North America. We're spread across more than 60 locations. Um, and the R&D team is very diverse and also spread across accordingly across all the continents. As a company, we're committed to sustainably grow by delighting more consumers globally and scale and agility are key for us. The R&D agenda is on a strong upswing journey. We are investing a lot into innovation, into longer term growth and therefore it's a very exciting position to be in at the moment and very much looking forward to the discussion we're about to embark on. Fantastic, thanks Miriam. Um, next up we have uh, Tia Rains. Tia, would you like to introduce yourself and your role at Ajinomoto? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Tia Rains. I'm Vice President of Customer Engagement and Strategic Development, which means I oversee our R&D group as well as our communications, PR, marketing, and then in part of our global nutrition strategy work. I'm based in the Chicago area. And for those of you that don't know, Ajinomoto is a Japanese-based company that was started in 1909 on the discovery of monosodium glutamate and is now a, an expert in all things fermentation, as well as we see health and wellness as one of our, our primary core competencies. So happy to be here today to be part of this discussion. Brilliant. Thanks, Tia. Um, okay, thirdly, we have uh, Jean-Christophe Flatin from Mars uh, and Marge Ez, uh, Mars Edge. Uh, Jean-Christophe, I know you, you wear two hats at Mars. Um, give, give us a brief introduction to both of those. Thank you so much, Matt. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So despite the French accent, I'm talking to you from New York City. Um, and I, yes, I have two hats. So first of all, I'm the leader of Mars Edge. Mars Edge is the latest born Mars business unit. Um, and our job is better life through nutrition. So it's a human health through nutrition business. My second hat is I'm in charge of innovation, science and technology for all Mars business units. Uh, if we step back, Mars is a family-owned uh, company born in 1911, so we are more than 100 years old, and we have a very diverse portfolio. You may know us for confectionery or chewing gum brands, but we are also in human food, pet food, and veterinary services. Specifically, Mars Edge, our job is to bring nutritional solutions to empower people having better lives. And you may know us through our small portfolio of brands, which is Cocovia in the U.S., and food spring in Europe. Fantastic, fantastic. Thanks, John Christoph. And then finally, uh, Daniel Grubbs, Managing Director of PepsiCo Ventures. Daniel, give us uh, a brief overview of, of you and, and your current role and responsibilities. Hello, everyone. Nice to be with you today. Uh, yeah, so I lead our, our corporate venture capital unit, um, which for, for PepsiCo, we're focused across the uh, food and beverage spectrum, um, including health and wellness as a, as a key terrain for us. Um, in addition to other areas of sport and fitness. Um, but but the, the focus for us is to partner with companies who are across the end-to-end uh, -end value chain, uh, B2B, B2C, um, and, and connect and partner back into our organization. In addition, we, will, uh, we also incubate innovation externally in the market through different programs um, and run an accelerated program also to support and 
uh, foster relations with uh, early stage companies. So uh, happy to be here today and join this discussion. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree a, a great panel and some, uh, some, some brilliant brands uh, on board uh, this afternoon. If we start then, I guess, by looking at the trend of, of health and wellness, you know, is it a trend? Is it a continuation of something that's been uh, around and important for years? And, and I guess, how have things changed more recently in, in your eyes? Miriam, perhaps if we start with you, how long have you noticed health and wellness being an important, con uh, important consumer trend in the food industry? I would say it's been around for a long, long time. Um, and um, for me, I would split them a bit apart. I think health and wellness have different starting points. On the health trends, um, as a company, we've embarked on sugar sodium reduction since the 1980s, more or less. Um, and have con continuously built an agenda in the space. On the health trend, we see that, you know, governments, key opinion leaders externally and, and also um, regulators took a stand quite early on. So I would argue probably the health trend has been around for a really long time. The wellness trend, something which we've seen in consumers' requests and demands evolving over the recent years, and that is now picking up the pace and is, is broadening its scope and opportunities. Sure, absolutely. And have you seen a, a particular picking up of pace uh, in light of the pandemic? I guess if we're looking at sort of the preventative side of, of wellness in particular. Yeah, it's interesting because, of course, during the pandemic, um, you know, the the request for immunity, for sanitization, for cleanliness of things is increasing. Um, I do believe that consumers' wishes for healthy foods that do good and keep people healthy and well in terms of resistance to bugs in terms of you know general health conditions has been there before i do think the pandemic has accelerated that a bit has put a few more words to the expectations that consumers might not have been able to verbalize so well before but i think the trend would have been where it is now despite the pandemic sure absolutely john christophe if i can come to you uh, at this point um we've talked about the uh, the trend being around for, for a reasonable amount of time and, and the pandemic perhaps accelerating some existing um, existing feelings within the consumer market. Um, are, are there any other dynamics at play here? Are there any um, other um, you know, trends in the market that have um, brought this even more into focus for you and, and Mars over the last few years? Yeah, I'll, I'll fundamentally agree with Miriam about it's not something that has emerged over the past 15 months just suddenly there. But the word I would use is, I think if you step back over the probably the last two decades, what we notice is there is a growing discrepancy, disconnect between the food we want and the nutrition we need. And, and let's pause here. Why do we have two words in our dictionary, food and nutrition? When I, when I say food, you may see something that is quite emotional, social, cultural. You're very elegantly looking at us, Matt, but you may already be thinking at the sushi you will have tonight or the pizza you will have next weekend or the barbecue. You see, we talk about something social, emotional. Nutrition on the other side, if you close your eyes, you may see a micronutrient table with a lot of figures and three, four decimals. You may see somebody in a white coat in a laboratory. And I think the pity is these two words have really gone apart. And, and what we see is a unique opportunity now to reconcile these two worlds of the food we want and the nutrition we need. And to your point, I think the acceleration is really happening now. And like Miriam said, I think the pandemic is just an acceleration, but why is now the time? I, I would say the combination of four factors, proactive self-care, and, and clearly the self-care of this notion of preventative health, I want to own my health destiny has really been reinforced through COVID time. Quantify self, millions of people, hundreds of millions of people are now feeling comfortable wearing a device and getting some information uh, with this device. We could debate if this device is providing great insight or just useless information, but at least it exists. Data on digital is therefore more and more around. We can turn that into an opportunity. And finally, we also see digitalization 
dramatically boosting the nutritional breakthrough from a science standpoint. So studies that would have taken decades previously are now progressing in a matter of years and sometimes months. So I think the combination of people wanting to own much more their health destiny, devices, data, digital, quantify self coming to rescue, and science breakthrough happening at the same time really form a unique once in a lifetime opportunity to accelerate that. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. And, and with that in mind, I imagine that was, um, you know, th those things you've mentioned were uh, a strong part of the reason that Mars started something like Mars Edge, which, which I believe is, is, is three, uh, three or four years old now. Um, perhaps this is a good opportunity. G give us a bit of an explanation as to, to what Mars Edge is. I think you described it to me as a, a sort of startup within a large organization. Um, how does that work and how does that fit in with what you've just described as the, um, the, the key changes and accelerations over the last few years? Yes, thank you, Matthew. Yes, we are three and a half years old, so toddlers. I think we, we, we not only walk, but sometimes we run, we know how to talk, but we're still very young and we're very small in a large ensemble, which gives us a lot of freedom whilst we have the ability to tap into the mothership capabilities and resources. And really, our job is both to build partner and acquire, and we really look at these three complementary levers to build a portfolio of nutrition solution businesses. So what are we looking at? We really want to reconcile this food you want and nutrition you need. And, and therefore we are looking at science-backed but consumer-centric solutions. We really want to empower consumers. Our big belief is whilst the attitude to nutrition playing a role to health is very strong, there are still a very large number of pain points that are preventing people from converting their attitudes to behaviors. And therefore, we are looking for business model, nutritional solution that really empower consumers to, to let nutrition play a stronger role in their life at the service of their health. So Cocovia in the US is a wonderful dietary supplement brand. It's a cocoa flavanol brand. Uh, that is really helping people from their heart health, from their cognition health, and with an intent to expand that further. Foodspring in Europe is a very active nutrition sports nutrition brand, which is really a holistic, uh, bring holistic things to consumers. It brings advices, insights, content, recipe, workout, and product and recipe recommendation. So as you can see, two very different business model to start with in our portfolio, but all glued by the same vision, which is really empower consumers. Fantastic, fantastic. We might come back to, to a couple of those brands that you mentioned uh, in, in Mars Edge uh, later on. Um, D Daniel, to, to bring you in here, um, I, I've seen that this health and wellness described as, as the new sustainability, not, not least at this, this conference over the last couple of days or so. Um, I guess in reference to, to how much of a priority it's become for, for big companies. We've heard it's not necessarily new, but um, you know, to, to what extent has, has PepsiCo changed and adapted your uh, commitment to health and wellness uh, over the last you know, two to three years? Well, and actually to your point about sustainable, I think that the two are very hand in hand. You know, I think that you, um, it, it, delivering on health and wellness and solutions to, to a marketplace and to a set of consumers um, also goes backstream into making sure that you're also supporting and supplying those in a very sustainable way, right? And I think um, uh, for, for egg consumers, they're also just as focused on, you know, the, the, the whole value chain and call it how, how what they're purchasing, how it's made and how it's developed and how it's logistically supported, right, into them. So I think for us as an organization, it's, it's, we're, we're thinking about both ends. Right of, of the products we deliver, um, still delivering on taste uh, with the right ingredients and the, the, the efficacious and the functionality of all them, but also how we're sustainably um, sourcing, developing, procuring, um, logistically supplying those products. Right, so um, for, you know, for us, it's it's thinking about, and that goes across our entire portfolio. Um, increasingly thinking about on the beverage end of how we've um, you know sustainably source and deliver uh, on 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 beverages, including uh, water and other flavor beverages with our acquisition of SodaStream a few years back, right? To, to make sure that we're staying on the forefront of, of delivering for consumers, 
taste, enjoyment, refreshment, but also we're doing it in a way where we think we believe are committing to sustainable supply and reducing um, single use plastic um, as an example, um, or, or other on the food side is you know how we're sourcing and delivering on better for you snacks uh, with Bear and our BFY uh, uh, brands, but also that we're working back, making sure that the, the, the plastics that we're using and the, the, the single use bags are, are gonna be continue to be the most sustainable um, delivery mechanisms possible behind and, and that are surrounding those products to end consumers. So okay. it's, it's, it's an important mission for us um, from end to end. Okay, superb, superb. And, and to bring Tia from uh, Ajinomoto in here, um, Tia, we, we've seen obviously that the eat well, live well um, strap uh, as part of uh, Ajinomoto's mission and, and you mentioned it in, in, in your introduction there. Um, how has Ajinomoto been reacting to, to health and wellness uh, over the last you know, year or so? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, it's a company that really has been focused on health and wellness for a long period of time, really since its inception. And it's really just evolved depending on sort of what's been happening during that time frame. And I think when Jean Christophe was talking, it just reminded me of I see the world in four different pillars, I guess, or four different uh, dimensions when it comes to creating healthy food products. And that's you've you've got these again these four different aspects of nutrition, of cost, of taste. And then now we have the new one of sustainability. And when you can, you know, the holy grail is to be able to get those all to align in a way that they are, you're maximizing or optimizing all four dimensions. And things like ingredient technologies help, packaging technologies, processing technologies, those are the things that over time have gotten us closer to finding that optimal, uh, you know, center of all four of those issues. Otherwise you're making trade-offs. And so, you know, 20 years ago with health and wellness is when we were in the thick of the free from uh, fad where it was taking out the fat, taking out the sugar, you know, and we were, there were lots of trade-offs there. Taste was trading off for that nutrition benefit. You know, now we're getting better and better as the focus on health and nutrition has shifted more to this presence of positives. What can we put in there that's going to have a beneficial effect on your health by being present within that product? And I think that's what we've been focusing most on in the last couple of years, even now more so with the pandemic is, you know, what can we put in there that optimizes the immune system or helps with aging in a healthy fashion? Um, quality of life is another component that I think is maybe part of wellness is maybe is a different dimension there. But I think that's sort of where, you know, Japan has focused as a country in terms of health. And then that's certainly what has inspired Ajinomoto in the last couple of years with our health and wellness initiatives. Absolutely, absolutely. And obviously, uh, healthy aging, uh, a big topic in, in that part of the world and, and Japan in particular. Um, I, I want to move the conversation on, on to uh, partnerships. We've had a couple of questions that I'm going to go to uh, in, in a second. Um, Tia, maybe if, if we start with you to, to, to start with, um, I, I know uh, Ajinomoto has a big focus, obviously, on, on internal R&D, um, but you, I think there's a number of partnerships in, in, in Asia. Um, are you now as an organization looking at more external partnership opportunities uh, across the rest of the world in this area? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've had, to your point, a lot of success within, especially within Japan and other parts of Asia, of bringing together parties to solve nutrition issues. And that includes government, uh, local universities, as well as nonprofits, you know, working side by side, even sometimes with other companies to, to solve for some of these bigger challenges that are out there. And within Japan, within Asia, that seems to be embraced to a greater degree at this point point in time than other parts of the world, especially in the US and maybe in Europe, there's still this, you know, to use upon a distaste for large food companies where maybe people don't want to work side by side with us to solve for a nutrition issue because it may be seen as a conflict of interest. I think those barriers have been breaking down over time. And I think hopefully we want to start using the success that we've had with these partnerships already and start bringing that to other parts of the world. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, we're staying on the partnership theme then. Um, I, I, I'm going to pick up on one of the questions that, that we've had. Um, and maybe if we, if we start with Miriam, uh, the, the question is, how do you go about finding the right companies to part with, to partner with? What kind of activities do you undertake? 
uh, where can prospective partners meet you or, or come into contact with you? I'm sure that's a question on, on the lips of uh, m much of our audience. Um, Miriam, do, do you want to take that one, maybe give us an idea as to how external innovation works at, at, at Kraft Heinz, um, and then perhaps move on to, to answering that specific question? Yeah, super. Thank you very much. I think that's a great question. And um, interestingly, Kraft Heinz, and some of you might be aware of the company history, so the company really merged only about six years ago. The Kraft legacy um, with a strong footprint in the US has a strong research credential and 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 also therefore the organizational setup the heinz legacy contrary to that was always quite operational focused and also therefore very much with partnership in the forefront of r d and therefore a lot of the zone the international zone that i'm heading um, is based on partnerships from the start and we are only increasing the focus here because we see the world moving very very fast we do a lot of things in house and we have a very strong talent base and skill base in house but we also acknowledge that the time it would take to build the skills of the future that we need would be outperformed and we would be late if we wouldn't find the right partners so for us it's very very much in our DNA to partner externally and also as an R&D function to use the network that is around us in all the locations. Some locations we are more mature than in others and this is also the beauty of the opportunity of the digitalized world and coming back to the start of our conversation I do think this is where COVID had a positive impact because we're now quite at ease to connect digitally and therefore to talk to partners whom we probably would not have talked before COVID. So that's one of the, the plus points we should not forget about. Um, to the question, um, I think, how do we go about finding the right companies to partner with? There's, of course, legacy in place. We have strong networks. We have fantastic suppliers on our side, so they are important partners. But I think in nowadays world, one of the key needs for us as an R&D function is to do external scouting and scoping. So talking to a lot of people, going, of course, to events, conferences, fairs, to meet, to show a profile, to invite for contacts, but also actively targeting. We're quite clear where our technology unlock needs of the future lie and also where our strategic focus areas are. So we're trying to find the right partners by really just meeting companies, meeting startups, but also by using the expanded network via suppliers. Um, what type of activities do we undertake, I think, was one part of the question as well. And for us, it ranges quite broad. Um, we do um, developments for full formulations, for full product or pack designs in a collaborative environment with external partners. We sometimes also look at specific needs that we have to solve a technology challenge, and then we just work on that specific challenge. And sometimes we just, you know, try to find the right partner who can do things with us, but also for us, because we might not have the facilities or the capabilities in house. So I would say it's a very, very broad approach that we're choosing. And then we're just trying to be as sharp as we can upfront on understanding what's really the the issue, the opportunity and the objective we're having. Um, meeting partners happens, as said, in a lot of those events like this one, but also by, again, using the network and um, you can reach out to us. I know this is an ask, find us on LinkedIn, connect via us, um, write me an email as targeted as possible. We're always happy to hear from, you know, new kids in our, in our network system. Great, very helpful. Thanks, Miriam. Well, maybe if we bring in Daniel for, for the, the corporate venture capital perspective here. Um, Daniel, I, I guess sort of building on that question, uh, how, how does PepsiCo go about uh, evaluating a potential investment? And it might also be worth mentioning that um, I know you guys also look at co-development and, and co-creation uh, opportunities as, as well as um, sort of equity investment as well. So give us a yeah. bit of an explanation as to, sure. to that, that process. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I appreciate it. And, and I'll, you know, painting a spectrum of, of, um, of companies and, and co-development, but also of what we look for. And I would say is that we, we are very active and proactive around um, the, the consumer spaces, as well as um, what, what we foresee as potential um, horizons of opportunity. And in there, we might 
find companies who are uniquely um, positioned, we think, to win in that space. And what we, you know, from, from if they're already operating, really that starts becoming a question about what sort of proof of concept and uh, right, right to win do we think that they have on, on a going basis, right? And so if they're, if they're in market in particular, um, it, it becomes really a question around have they have developed a sense for who they are, right? What their position is and, and, and have they started, you know, resonating with consumers in a way such that we can measure that they're going to be able to sustain that, let alone start, start growing and scaling that. Yeah. And so whether that's an online business or it's an offline through, through traditional retail channels, um, there's a different set of metrics, right? That we can uncover and understand, uh, that, op that opportunity, um, if it's an earlier even stage, right, where it's still a little more seed, what we call seed stage, right, or even more uh, earlier than that, um, it's really, we'll still be interested and supportive of those companies. Um, but but how we think about working with them, partnering with them might be a little bit different. It might be more through our accelerator program to support, enable, and tighten their positioning, tighten their focus, really, what are the additional um, areas they need to go explore to develop those right proof points. Um, and we might do that through through our accelerator, which is more of a grant program um, and keeping close relations and guidance and support and counsel. Um, and the, the other end of the spectrum is where we don't really find companies who are we think uniquely going after a space that we think is um, ready to be solved for, um, but still needs work in terms of um, the actual product fit. And we will work with a set of founders and develop a founder and residence program to go develop businesses and um, seed stage and invest into those businesses with, with also other partners who we think are important to surround those, those founders with. Um, and, in, and in that case, really, again, it's, it's much more around how do we make sure they kind of start building the bones, right? Such that they can start putting on the proof of concept and uh, proof points to the business for, for further investment down, downstream. So kind of, a, it depends on where on the spectrum you know, what we're looking for will be appreciative of where they're at. And, and as the bigger they become, obviously it becomes a greater attention and focus towards, um, is it ready to scale? Sure, sure, absolutely. And, and Daniel, I know PepsiCo has the, um, the, the Kavita uh, brand, uh, the, the probiotic and, and, and kombucha drink. Um, yeah. and, and as I understand it, that was an initial investment that, that right. then an acquisition. Um, you know, perhaps you can give an insight into how that came about and what what interested you in in that product and, yeah. that, and that, that organization that brand yeah and this kind of goes back to about 2011 12 really where you know the a lot of our conversation here today around functionality and around you know at putting more good in and uh, for us understanding the importance of uh, gut health and really building off the backs i think that that gut health became a little more prominent in the early 2000s with in the yogurt space and and saw the opportunity really that that there was other form factors really where I think it could could be best delivered. Um, Kavita was was built in mission towards supporting so supporting gut health, supporting your digestive wellness. Um, and we saw that as an opportunity in particular how they were building the business, how the products were being put together uh, and the founder and passion towards that that we thought it was a, a great investment. Um, uh, work over the next three years, really in close partnership, right, on everything from product formulation to pe packaging, positioning, as well as distribution uh, partnership over time, where it eventually led to um, deciding to acquire the business um, and, and understanding at that point of what the growth longer term potential was, as well as from a distribution, but of course, also from a, a product portfolio um, standpoint. And I, I think um, you know, those early years were really about uh, making sure, back to your original prior question around, um, is, is this resonating with a consumer base? Um, do, do consumers have an understanding of, of the benefits? Um, what are some of the challenges still with taste, right? That, that, that's something that's critical, obviously, with cross food and beverages. As much functionality as we want to put into it, if it still doesn't deliver on taste, it becomes, becomes a major barrier we all have to overcome. Um, and so what are those what are those aspects that we need to modify, appreciate, understand um, about that to hopefully continue to um, get consumers to be attracted to this in greater and greater means. Um, so that that those years were really critical of that. And I think we've built on that successfully since then. Okay, really interesting. 
Um, I, I want to bring Jean Christophe in, maybe just to come back to, to the uh, original question from, from the audience on how you go about finding the right, the right companies to partner with. Um, Jean Christophe, I, I know Mars are very active in, in partnership and, and acquisitions. Um, I guess f first question is, do, do you have a particular checklist when you're assessing uh, a, a potential partnership or, or, or collaboration? And then how do you go about e executing on that? Thank you so much, Matt. And uh, yes, we have a checklist. So let me let me disclose that in the in the open. And and it's um, inspired by two things: strategic alignment and humility. So let me explain. Strategic alignment is mean that the first criteria we look at is how aligned are our visions, even even before continuing partnership or acquisition. Does the vision of of the organization we look at resonate with what we are trying to achieve. I think that's pretty fundamental because if this is not the case, then whatever capabilities execution, then that does not resonate. The second criteria on the checklist is science-backed, consumer-centric. Uh, there are a lot of fads out there, uh, a lot of people that are, are going for offers, promises, commitments that are not scientifically sub substantiated and we don't want to belong to that world so we have a very robust science scientific team checklist due diligence just to make sure that the commitment we will make to the consumers are one we can keep and at the same time we are looking for the capability which is a rare one uh, back to humility of finding the way to translate deep science or robust science into really consumer meaningful solutions so that's the second point of the checklist. The third one is how data and digital savvy the organization is. I think we know it's a, it's a need, it's a must of our era uh, to be data informed, to be digitally powered. And therefore, of course, we can help, we can bring some capabilities, but being 110 years old, we were not born in that era. So the more we can find a partner that brings all of that, the better it is. And finally, I would say, and this will look like a lot what we heard from Daniel, uh, what's the, what stage is the business model at? Do we talk about a great idea looking for its first proof of concept? Do we talk about uh, an idea that has already gained some momentum and that is looking for scale-up help? Or do we talk about an idea that is already quite strong, let's say in one geography and one channel, but that is looking for an expansion booster so additional capabilities? And as we look at that, um, that guides the different way we would partner or, or acquire. And that's where humility kicks in. We don't come to those conversations saying, you know what, we are the big ones we know. We may be large, but Marseille is very young and very small. And we know that our job is to be relevant to the consumers one generation after the other. And this absolute duty of relevance or relevancy for consumers is what guides us. So what we look, when we look at that, at that stage is how complementary our capabilities are. Where can we support each other? When can we boost each other in order to determine how to work together? So that's our little checklist. Vision, science-backed consumer-led, data, digital, business model, and overall, what's the consumer relevancy that this organization would bring? Okay, that, that, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. Um, I, I want to come back to the other question that we had, which, which was a question around um, yeah, companies implementing tools like wearables and, and digital platforms. And I guess that kind of comes on to what I was hoping to cover next anyway, which I guess was to drill down into some of the, the you know, most exciting areas of, of nutrition and health and wellness for, for, for your companies. Um, Tia, maybe we come to you here. What, what, what subsectors or types of health and wellness product are you most interested in now? And, and, and do you see the most potential for in the future, either from an internal R&D or, or an external partnership point of view? Sure. Well, I think like probably all the companies here, we're interested in, in personalization. What does that mean in terms of nutrition? How do we realize that in a way that uh, is realistic and uh, profitable, but also is actual science-based and meaningful to the consumer. Um, so that's something that I think we, we continue to try to understand is that science unfolds and as technologies, whether they're wearables or other devices, 
whether those uh, technologies are being advanced. Um, as I mentioned before, we can we because of where the company is based, we have a, a vested interest in this concept of healthy aging and quality of life over time. And so technologies that, you know, maybe are even beyond just food itself, you know, how, how do we marry up, you know, the concept of, of healthy foods and diets with other lifestyle factors to be able to help that population through, you know, what are, are often challenging years and get them to this place of these healthy living years, meaning, you know, how do you extend quality of life, mobility, cognitive function, uh, some of these other uh, just, you know, realities of aging, how do you extend normal function for a longer period of time? And we're certainly looking for partners that can help in, in both of those, I guess, big sectors, the personalization standpoint, as well as this, this healthy aging. Fantastic, fantastic. And um, to, to, I guess to, to address the question, um, yeah, is Ajinomoto looking at things like, like wearables and digital platforms as, as, as part of that, um, as part of that strategy that you mentioned there? Yeah, always. We are. We're trying to wrap our head around that. We, we're also a company that's not just a food company. We've got a pharmaceutical group as well as some other kind of companion industries that are, are part of our, our overall company. So, you know, we've, we've got some our fingers in a couple of, of these different digital areas, although we're still interested in seeing how this applies to food. I guess that's really, I, I think, one of the, the questions and I'm a nutrition scientist by training, which is, you know, how, how do you marry that technology up in a way that actually de derives a real benefit to the, the consumer and actually helps with their health on a sustainable, not sustainable in terms of environmental, but something that's, that's going to actually be incorporated, integrated into a life that makes a, a real difference. And so we're interested in that space as well. Okay. Okay, great. Well, we're staying on this this topic of, um, I guess, the most exciting areas of, of, of innovation that, that your companies are looking at. Um, Miriam, are, are there any specific areas that are at top of your list at the moment uh, in terms of your, your your search for external innovation? And I guess specifically, are there any you know, unmet needs with, within this sector um, that you think you know the, the SME and, and early stage community should be should be looking at? Thanks, Matt. I would say the, the, the landscape is evolving at light speed, right? So sometimes it's even difficult to keep track. Um, I mentioned before that we have a strong track record in sugar and sodium reduction. That journey continues. Um, we have a responsibility. We are selling our products to millions and billions of people around the globe every day. So um, of course, we, we want to make sure that we continue to de deliver to those expectations. So next generation, sugar and sodium reduction which goes beyond you know what's out there already in terms of stevia potassium chlorate and other things which are commoditized is very important for us and i do think that the technology challenges lies in the holistic design of your proposition you want to drive consumer engagement as also tia mentioned and you want to make sure you deliver to highest taste expectations which consumers rightly so have um, I would say a general need that we have um, probably as an industry is to make sure things remain affordable. What we see in the health and wellness segment is that a lot of the evolving opportunities in positive nutrition, in enrichment and fortification is still not affordable enough for mass market across the globe. And I think this is, of course, where scale matters and will bring positive effects, but also further unlocks to create affordable propositions for those ingredients, for those processes where you retain ingredients, whatever it means. I think that is definitely a focus area. Um, I would say, um, lastly, also in this in this area, um, finding the the nuggets of you know evolving opportunities which can be brought but might not yet be common space in a relevant way for consumers. And that it has been mentioned before, making sure that there's a clear benefit where consumers are willing to try a product and repeat the purchase and spend money for, understanding that. So starting from the insights end, understanding the consumer unlock and consumer need, that is another area which goes beyond the R&D agenda for sure, but R&D has a massive stake in talking to consumers and translating that into you know, technology solutions that then help us to move forward. 
Okay, okay, fantastic. We've had an interesting question uh, from our audience. Um, would the panel consider partnering with a health and wellness company outside of food uh, consumer products, such as a, a corporate wellness uh, program? Uh, Jean-Christophe, I think you're, you're happy to take that one. Yes, my dear. And the answer is yes, absolutely yes. And for a simple reason, because we start with the consumer. And I shared earlier, I think one of the reasons we see this gap between attitudes to yes, I would love nutrition or food to play a bigger role in my health and behavior, which is this is not happening at the same extent, is because people face a number of pain points. And, and one of them is, I don't know what's relevant for me. Tell me, tell me what, what would be the right nutrition. But if you provide this information in the form of a micronutrient table, you've not done your job because it's not an actionable insight. So then you need to translate the nutrition recommendation into a lifestyle recommendation that empower consumers. Clearly, consumers do not want to have a cop or a teacher in their back telling them what to do. They want to be informed, sometimes educated, and they want to be empowered to bring nutrition into their life, not to change their life because of nutrition. So as a consequence, my answer to, would you consider partnering with people providing health and wellness, nutrition support, coaching, et cetera, beyond food? The answer is yes, because it's in my view that only by offering a holistic approach to consumer, providing actionable insights, and really helping them integrate that into their existing lifestyle and rituals that we will help them crack that in their life. And therefore it's multifaceted. Food is one aspect, but coaching, advice, insights, content is a big part of that as well. Yeah, if it, if it, if I could just build on it, exactly that. And I think if, if um, there's opportunities um, with a number of back to the wearables and to the um, companies who, uh, as an example, we're supporting through investment and other means to also partner back in with those corporate wellness programs, our corporate wellness and other corporate wellness, because um, that back to the point of, of insight and education and, and, and understanding is um, those corporate wellness programs are also looking to, to deliver to, um, to their employees and to, to others a lot of that information. And, and the wearables, particularly in companies, are providing a lot of that insight. And how do you then connect the, the pieces of the puzzle together? And so uh, we're also very supportive of, of helping kind of build those bridges and build those connections such that, you know, uh, there's actually more partnership kind of going across the full ecosystem of health and wellness. Great, fantastic, fantastic. Well, uh, in our audience today, we're, we're going to have a number of um, smaller emerging brands and, and, and SME companies as well. We, we've talked about how those companies can work with you. We've talked about your your specific areas of interest. Um, D Daniel, staying with you, perhaps. Yeah. What, what advice would you give to to a CEO or, or a founder of one of those uh, smaller brands or, or SMEs that was hoping to secure investment from from PepsiCo Ventures? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say um, is the, the biggest thing is just know who you are, right? And really being critical and understanding of, of, um, of, of what you're after and sort of the vision and the articulation of that, right? And um, understanding as well as that that can, that can change and modify with, um, with as the market changes and as you, you continue to develop those proof points. Um, but I think that's, that's really critical. I think it's also is... Ideally, is that you continue to surround yourself with a good team, um, whether they're on staff or it's a set of advisors. Um, you know, none of the effort is going to be done alone. Um, you know, and I think it's it's understanding of, you know, how those founders are also continue to um, surround themselves with experience, exposure, um, expertise, and in, in 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 that effort. Um, and and through that is if they're at the point where they're actually in market and they're starting to develop. Um, a sense for who they are, but also traction with with a consumer is that they can show it and articulate it in a, in a clear way. Um, unbiased is, you know, is, is and that's what we would look for is unbiased objectively is, you know, will does this stand on its own? Um, you know, and, and those are things where uh, we and I, I know a lot of others as well can can try to be supportive and partners and hopefully um, enhance the value of the company that they're building, but also uh, ultimately it's their company, and it's ultimately it's 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 going to be um, what's going to be critical there is that they are going to be the one driving the ship, but that they need 
they need, they're going to need the right support and they're going to need to pull in that expertise and that effort along the way. Um, and so uh, we're there to be helpful, but also ultimately is, um, you know, it's, we want to be supportive of that vision that, that they're, that they've developed and they want to kind of continue to see prosper in the market. Sure, absolutely. And, and uh, same question to you, to you John Christoph. What, what would your advice be to uh, prospective partners that might be listening into, into this? So first of all, back to humility, no, no preaching or teaching, just sharing expectations here. Um, clarity, depth, and capability would be my headline. So clarity is what's your point of view on the world? What are your unique contributions? What do you bring to the table that is different from the others? Depth, which is once you've chosen your point of view and your who are you, what do you bring to the world? Go deep on that and, and don't stay light and bring all the depths you can to this unique differentiation. And finally, capabilities, as Daniel said, both internally, externally, it's um, when, when you're at early stage, it's not like you're building an empire, so it can absolutely be so an external network, but how can you showcase the capabilities you've put together to make this unique point of view to the world credible? And I think with that at the table, it's recipe for a great conversation with people like Daniel and, and, and us and Tia and Miriam, as it looks like we are competing for getting the largest number of emails following this panel. So I think, uh, I think I'm talking in our joint name. I think that's certainly for me a recipe for success. I'm sure there will be some emails, absolutely. Okay, well, we're coming towards the end of, of the session. I just want to um, sort of finish by, I guess, getting our crystal balls out uh, and, and, and looking to the future. Um, Tia, maybe if I come to you, how do you see the health and wellness part of, of the food industry changing over the next five years? Well, I think we'll probably continue down this path that we've, we've started on, which is a good one. Um, Jean-Christophe mentioned early on that there's been a lot of science and nutrition that has probably continued to uh, push an understanding of the general consumer over the value of investing in your health through food. And I think the science, we, we've got a bit of a pause here because of the pandemic. A lot of research has, has temporarily been put on hold, but I think the science is just going to continue to be published to support the value in, in making better dietary decisions. And then as I said at the beginning, I think the challenge for the, the food industry, the food ecosystem is figuring out, you know, how can we identify new technologies to bring these four components closer together? Nutrition, affordability, taste, and sustainability. I think that's gonna be where the success is in health and wellness going forward. Thanks. Great, great, fantastic. And, and, and Miriam, maybe final word to you. What, what, what are your predictions uh, for, for the next five years? Where, where do you see uh, your priorities and objectives lying? Yeah, I would, I would answer it slightly different. I fully agree with what Tia said, but um, you know, I do assume the pace of change will continue to accelerate. And therefore I do assume that also the innovation delivery times will continue to reduce. Digitalization will definitely change our R&D agenda and well beyond. So faster, more targeted product pack design, including the health and wellness elements of it. Instant consumer feedback will feed our thinking ongoingly in iterative cycles. Um, and with that in mind, I do assume the ecosystems will shift. Um, so more partnerships, more external collaborations, all of that will gain relevance and will increase importance. Um, but also, I do believe that, you know, we need more technology unlocks in the future to crack those challenges as, as they have been referred to from affordability and cost to taste, to quality, to processability, to bioavailability, to whatever it is. Um, so therefore, digitalization is super relevant in this uh, machine learning is getting its place, but also connecting the dots in a puzzle in the relevant way. I think that's the magic also of R&D in the future to find the right partners to put the pieces together in the right way in order to accelerate the technology development in the relevant way. Fantastic, fantastic. So, sounds like exciting times, but for, for sure. Uh, well, we've come to the end of our, our, our allocated time, uh, so that just leaves me to um, give a big thank you to, to all my panellists 
uh, for your contribution today. Some really interesting insights there from some of the biggest food companies in the world about investing and partnering in, in, in health and wellness in particular. Uh, a reminder, our, our panellists um, are available on our, our partnering system. Uh, the Healthspan show continues to um, continue at pace for the next uh, three days. We're, we're going until the end of the week on Friday. There's two more sessions today specifically looking uh, at the area of nutrition. So do uh, tune in for those if you can. For now, though, I'd just like to say a thank you again to uh, all of my panellists uh, and thank you to you for, for watching as well and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.